so good morning everyone uh, i am colonel viker and dr manik and dr akar with me as the chair so i welcome you all to this hyde park session so i'll just read out the rules the duration of each paper is 4 minutes so i request all speakers to stick to their timings so we'll start the session now so i had one request from one of the presenter as she has got a session elsewhere so i'd like to call her first <clears throat> dr reena gupta please come and start your presentation please start yes sir good morning everyone i'll be speaking on the study of clinical profile and surgical intervention a case series of advanced retraction syndrome no financial disclosure advanced retraction syndrome can be classified on the basis of the ocular deviation in the primary position into type 1 type 2 and type 3 drs and the classical clinical features include limitation in abduction variable limitation in adduction globe retraction and upshoots and downshoots on adduction The indications of surgery remain significant ocular deviation in the primary position, marked anomalous head posture, severe globe retraction, and disfiguring upshoots and downshoots. So we uh, started the clinical etiological profile and surgical intervention in a case series of DRS. It was a descriptive pilot study and included all the patients who were diagnosed as DRS from January 2017 to April 2019, with minimum follow-up of six months. The methodology included written informed consent, comprehensive ocular examination, and orthoptic evaluation was done, which was followed by MRI only in indicated cases and surgical intervention, which was case based. Coming to the results, the total number of cases with a follow up of six months were 15, out of which 11 were female and 40% had bilateral DRS. We found that the frequency of abnormal head posture was seen in majority of the cases, and patients with face turn were around 56%. 56% of the patients had strabismic amblyopia, which was followed by patients with visual deprivation amblyopia, and the uh, anisometric amblyopia was seen in the minimum number of cases. The esotropia and exotropia was seen in equal frequency in all the cases. Uh, we also had severe globe retraction with upshoots and downshoots in around 10 cases. Uh, the pattern of ocular motility was only abduction limitation was seen in 46% of the cases combination of abduction and adduction limitation was seen in 46% of the cases and only adduction limitation was seen in 8% of the cases according to the primary angle of deviation uh, which was around less than 20 prism diopters we defined it as small angle and that was seen in around 50% of the cases The treatment was surgical uh, intervention, and it was case-based, and it was tailored according to the clinical findings and the intraoperative findings. The so different procedures which were done, wide split with LR resection, whether unilateral or bilateral, was done in majority of the cases. Followed by wide split LR resection with MR resection, and uh, bilateral MR resection or SRT with MR resection was done in minority cases. Uh, coming to the follow-up of six months, wide split surgery. was done in 53% of the cases and unilateral wide split was done in 41% of the cases if we talk about the success of our results we uh, were able to achieve significant improvement in the cosmetic um, uh, appearance and also significant resolution of the face turn with successful ocular alignment around 70% of the cases there were only a few cases less than 10% in which we had residual globe retraction with residual upshoot and that was only in severe globe retraction patients 
So we compared our study uh, to the findings uh, of various studies which were published in literature and we found that similar findings were there was a female preponderance, higher incidence of unilateral cases with left eye which was dominantly affected, type 1 was the most common, 50% of the cases had abnormal head posture on presentation, small angle of deviation was seen in the primary position and surgery was the mainstay of treatment with Y split lateral re recession proved to be very effective in treating the upshoots and global attraction. The findings which were unique to our study were variable incidence of adduction limitation, equal frequency of ESO and exotropia in DRS, severe globe retraction which was more commonly seen and both horizontal recti recession was able to treat 50% of the globe retraction. 70% success and 71% success was achieved in correcting the face turn with optimal surgical uh, optimal ocular alignment and not much significant improvement was seen in the ocular movements. Thank you. Okay, nice presentation. So, I wanted to ask you, did you operate in all the cases and what was your indication of surgery in all these cases? Yes, sir. So, advanced attraction syndrome, I have included the cases, uh, all cases with diagnosis DRS and all these were the cases in which a surgical intervention was done. The indication of surgery in most of these cases were ocular deviation if it was more than 20 present diopters in the primary position or there was an associated abnormal face turn or there was a significant globe retraction with upshoot. So, all these cases, most of them had a significant ocular deviation in the primary position and around, uh, most of them had abnormal face turn also and around 60% of the patients had a global retraction with upshoots. Okay, thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you so much. So I'll call on the next speaker. Is uh, Dr. Sadhya Smita. Is she there? Yeah, please come. Good morning everyone. I would like to thank AIOS for providing me such a wonderful opportunity to present my case report on acquired capillary hemangioma of eyelids. Capillary hemangioma is a benign tumor caused by abnormal growth of anastomosing small vascular channel without true encapsulation. According to the age of presentation, capillary hemangioma can be classified into congenital, infantile and acquired. Infantile capillary hemangioma is the most common tumor of orbit and periocular area of childhood encompassing nearly 5 to 10 percent of all soft tissue tumors of infancy. On the other hand, acquired capillary hemangioma of eyelid seen in elderly population is a very rare occurrence which makes it proper diagnosis and management very crucial for further understanding of this entity. So which brings me to the details of my case report here. A 60 year old male presented in our ophthalmologic OPD with complaints of a reddish mass on right upper eyelid since one month which was indeterminate in onset and gradually progressive in size. It was associated with mechanical ptosis grade 3 and diminution of vision in right eye with best corrected visual equity of counting finger up to 3 feet. It was not associated with any other ocular or systemic complaints. On examination of swelling we found that it was a 3.5 cm in length and 3.5 cm in width pedunculated mass with irregular surface, non tender non-mobile, non-compressible, non-pulsatile, uh, translucent in nature and firm in consistency. B scan of right eye was done which showed a well-defined ecogenic lesion with internal vascularity suggestive of neoplastic etiology. On the basis of clinical feature and radiological investigation, a provisional diagnosis of acquired capillary hemangioma was made. We did excisional biopsy and this specimen was sent for histopathological examination. On histopathological uh, findings further confirmed our diagnosis, diagnosis of acquired capillary hemangioma. The patient was followed up on 15th post-operative day. A small residual lesion was present on lid margin for which cryotherapy was done. Uh, acquired capillary hemangioma is very uncommon in adults. We performed a review of literature and found that very few cases have been reported so far and most of these cases were seen in less than 40 years of age. Uh, the main etiological factor which are proposed for development of acquired capillary hemangioma are hormonal changes during puberty and pregnancy, any trauma or irritative agent. Females are three times more prone to develop acquired capillary hemangioma than males. 
it is important to rule out other differential diagnoses of acquired capillary hemangioma which includes pyogenic granuloma cavernous hemangioma carposi sarcoma angiosarcoma intravascular endothelial hyperplasia and acquired tufted angioma Infantile capillary hemangioma regress spontane spontaneously during first decade of life, but acquired capillary hemangioma do not involute like their infantile counterpart, which makes a diagnosis and treatment necessary. The treatment modalities currently available are intralesional and systemic steroid, interferon alpha, topical timolol maleate, uh, oral propranolol, laser treatment, and surgical excision. The age of onset, absence of any predisposing factors, male gender and fast progression make this a unique case. So this case is being presented to you to highlight the occurrence of capillary hemangioma in adults and need for its diagnosis and proper management. The histological, histopathological features and clinical presentation of these lesions are distinctive and our choice of treatment which was excisional biopsy uh, seemed to be very successful. The lesion was removed in its entirety and post-operative cosmetic results were excellent. Thank you. Healthy margin or uh, only the... No ma'am, we removed it uh, with uh, completely. Meaning? Meaning like uh, there was we uh, left one centimeter healthy margin and then all... One, one centimeter? Yeah. Okay. How did you reconstruct? What ma'am? How did you reconstruct then, then? Uh, re, re reconstruct the, the lid? Ha, we, with uh, five zero vicral suture, we reconstructed the lid. Okay. So we go on to the next speaker now. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Sanya Gulwani there. So she's not there. Then next, Dr. Zia Ul Haq Yasir. Is uh, Dr. Siddharth Madan there? Uh, Dr. Ishita Jain? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning everyone. I'm presenting a paper on retrobulbar amphotericin B as an adjunctive treatment in rhinoorbital mucormycosis. I have no financial disclosure. So rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis is a potentially life-threatening invasive fungal infection that was seen almost exclusively in immunocompromised hosts. But recently a surge in number of cases occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. But there is a currently a lack in literature and appropriate guidelines to use the transcutaneous retrobulbar injection of amphotericin B as an adjunct treatment modality for this infection. This case reports documents are, are a case of ROCM successfully treated with tram B injection uh, conjunct, in tram B in conjunction with uh, systemic antifungals and endoscopic sinus debridement. Coming to the materials and methods, it is an interventional case report. A 35-year-old man presented with right-sided post-COVID rhinoorbital mucormycosis with right-sided cerebral palsy. He complained of right-sided facial swelling for 15 days and is asso was associated with dulling and non-progressive uh, on and off pain. He was a known case of diabetes mellitus for the past one year with a poor diabetic control and HbA1c of 10.8%. He, gave, he had a history of COVID-19 infection 20 days back and uh, with a history of a hospitalization where he was given oral steroids for five days and oxygen therapy. His HRCT score, uh, CORAD score on presentation was four and CT severity score was one on 25. The MRI brain with PNS, that is paranasal sinuses and orbit and CT paranasal sinuses showed bilateral maxillary ethmoid sphenoid uh, frontal sinusitis and was suggestive of right-sided orbital mucormycosis. On uh, examination, his best corrected visual acuity was 660 in the right eye and 66 on the left eye. Uh, on anterior segment, as we can see here, the lids were edematous, conjunctiva was chemos with superficial punctate keratitis from 5 to 8 o'clock uh, in the right eye. Uh, and the pupils had, uh, pupils were round and sluggishly reactive. 
the extraocular movements that showed right-sided uh, total of thalmoplegia. He was managed, he was started on uh, IV amphotericin B in 5% dextrose twice a day for 30 days and renal functions were monitored regularly. He, it was uh, supplemented with fundus endoscopic sinus surgery which is FES and diagnostic nasal endoscopy with suction and clearance was done which was followed by KOH and uh, culture for the same. Uh, the right-sided exposure keratopathy was managed with lubricating eye drops and ointment and taping. So this is the timeline for uh, management of this patient and intervention. So day zero, FES was done for the right side and IV amphotericin B was started. Day four, uh, diagnostic nasal endoscopy was done and uh, suction and clearance was again done and he was re referred to ophthalmology OPD where uh, his visual activity was recorded in the right eye as 660. By ten, day, day 10, uh, his visual activity reduced to counting fingers 2 meters. So on day 11, 12, 13, uh, in accordance with an article published by Hiya Bayashi, uh, uh, we had given 0.7 ml, 3.5 mg injection tram B in the right eye. And the visual activity was recorded as CF 2 meters on that day with right eye total of thalmoplegia. Uh, one injection was given on each on 11th day, 12th day and 13th day. Uh, on 20th day, the, we noted slightly gain in the uh, um, extraocular movements and that's when we decided to repeat the site of injections again for three days, the same dose. By day 22, his visual acuity had gained to right eye, uh, sorry, 660. Uh, this was in conjunction with the IV amphotericin B that was already going on. By day 47, uh, he had restored the, uh, the were partial restric uh, restriction of movements and his best corrected visual acuity was 618. Uh, as we can see in the images, on day, of on day of presentation, his right eye had total of thalmoplegia and on day of discharge, we can see the vertical directions are present. So on discharge, visual acuity improved to 618 with partial restoration of the movements, extraocular movements. Uh, we discharged this patient on tablet posaconazole 300 mg twice a day for two days, followed by uh, OD dosage for 21 days, lubricating eye drops for the, and eye ointment for the right eye, and light eye lid taping at night. Uh, conclusion and discussion, the drawback of the systemic antifungals is their limited tissue penetration which can be overcome by the local administration of antifungals, thus reducing the burden of orbital disease. Uh, thus, uh, studies with larger sample size are needed to ascertain the role of tram B in halting and progression of fungal orbital infection. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you show the MRI plates? Is it here? Uh, Ma'am, no, I don't have it you don't in the it. presentation. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we have given in the late, at the junction of lateral two third and uh, medial one third. Oh, sorry, um, lateral one third and medial two thirds. And uh, we used the uh, um, 18 gauge needle map. We advanced it till the hub of the needle was re uh, reached in the skin and then uh, after a positive aspiration for the, negative aspiration for the blood, we injected uh, the injection. We had reconstituted amphotericin B liposomal. Sorry, ma'am. Oh, ma'am, I don't remember, sorry. And what was the schedule? For how many days you gave it? Uh, Ma'am, three days we gave, uh, 3.5 milligram, and uh, uh, we reconstituted with 10 ml, uh, 50 mg vial comes, ma'am. We reconstituted with 10 ml uh, sterile water. After that, we draw uh, 0.7 ml, so concentration comes to be 3.5 milligrams. Then after three days? Uh, Ma'am, uh, only three days we give, three consecutive days, and then we observe, okay. because the action of amphotericin B can range from 24 hours to 15 days, so we followed that. Did you encounter any toxic effects of the drug? Um, no, sir, not in this patient, uh, not on the local administration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, the next speaker, Dr. Anjani Agarwala, is she there? Yes, 
Yeah. Good morning to one and all present here. I am going to present my case, which is isolated eyelid cysticycosis, or a case report. So, a cyst in the skin of the orbit is a fairly common presenting complaint in general ophthalmological practice. The differential diagnosis of such a lesion includes a number of infective, inflammatory, and neoplastic condition of various origin. The current case is presented in order to illustrate an example of one of the uncommon infective causes for such a lesion. So, a 20-year-old male presented with swelling in the left lower eyelid since 20 days. There was no history of trauma to the eye, watering or discharge from the eye. No other significant medical or surgical history was there. On examination, visual equity of both the eyes were 6x6 and N6. Mass was there in the left lower eyelid, measuring around 3 by 3.5 cm. There was localized erythema, edema, mild tenderness. This was firm in consistency and skin over the mass is freely movable. Transillumination test was negative. No localized lymphadenopathy was there. Rest of the uh, local examination were normal and right eye examination was also within normal limit. USG B scan was uh, done uh, cystic lesion in the left lower eyelid on medial side which was around 1.3 by 0.8 cm with hyperdense intramural structure was found. CT scan of brain and orbit were done which was found to be normal. Complete blood count showed eosinophilia with an absolute eosinophil count of 440 eosinophils per millimeter cube. Stool examination was positive for tenia solium. And serum IgG was done which was found a slightly raised that is more than 2.2. A diagnosis of left lower eyelid solitary subcutaneous cystopsychosis was made. Patient was started on oral albendazole with uh, 15 mg per kg per day in 2 divided doses for around 8 to 15, for 15 days and corticosteroid 1 mg per kg per day for 4 weeks. Symptomatic improvement was seen with resolution of signs of inflammation. Two weeks after the completion of conservative treatment, there was persistence of cyst without signs of inflammation, promoting surgical removal of the cyst. A large subcutaneous nodule of fibrovascular tissue was encountered from which a 8 by 6 by 0.4 uh, uh, 4 mm smooth thin walled cream colored cyst was removed and subjected to histopathological examination. On histopathological examination, the outer cyst wall consists of undulating tegumented covered with, uh, tegument covered with microvilli, which contains a central invaginated scolex with suckers and a raw stellum containing a raw of hooklet suggestive of larval stages of tenia solium. So, uh, first case of uh, in my discussion part, I would like to uh, discuss the first case of ocular cysticycosis was reported by Sommering and the larva was demonstrated and extracted by Scott. Ocular or adnexal involvement, which is in my case, occurs in 13 to 46 percent of infected patients. And in Western literature, the most common site is the posterior segment, whereas in Indian literature, ocular adnexa is the most common site. And the clinical manifestations depends on location, size, relation to adjacent structures, and stage of development of the cyst. Isolated ocular involvement is rare, with isolated orbital adnexal involvement is an occasional occurrence in clinical practice. Orbital and adnexal cysticycosis, there is a predilection for children and young adults with no sex preponderance. Cysticycosis is easily diagnosed by orbital imaging, which is highly specific, whereas CT and MRI imaging not only confirm the diagnosis but also helps to rule out neurocysticycosis. Therapy must be individualized according to the location of the parasite and the activity of the disease in a given case. Surgical removal is advocated for subconjunctival and eyelid cysticycosis. So to conclude with, intraocular infestation by cysticircosis cellulosis are more common as compared to ocular adnexal involvement. A solitary cysticircus lesion is usually clinically confused with other intramuscular tumors like lipoma, neuroma, neurofibroma, sarcoma, soft tissue myxoma and hydrated cyst. Orbital imaging is very important in making this diagnosis. Whereas in young and adult living in an endemic area, high index of suspicion is needed for extraocular cysticircosis. Thank you very much. Okay, so was this a live cyst or a dead cyst? Sir? Was this a live cyst or Sir, a Sir, inflammation cyst? was there, so it must be a dying cyst. Okay, so you have to look for the mobility, the cyst yeah. moves if it is live. Yes, sir. And many a times in such cases it extrudes on its own through the conjunctiva. Yes, sir. Okay. But inflammation was there, associated inflammation was there, so it, it is not a dead cyst. Okay, there is uh, another second line of drug. Praziquintal. Yes. Uh, did you try that? No, it was uh, with al albendazole, it worked. 
So okay. after 15 days, the inflammation was decreased and we could remove the cyst. cyst. And then histopathological examination was done because uh, IgG level were not very high. So it's slightly high only. So that why, that's why conf to confirm histopathological examination was done. Okay. Actually, inflammation is more in a dead cyst. So after you give that medicines, there's leakage of the fluid and it may cause more inflammation. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is this. And the second thing, uh, you have to take the history whether it's a vegetarian or non-vegetarian. It's more common in which? Vegetarians or non-vegetarians? So he was a non-vegetarian. So it's more common in vegetarians. <laughs> Due to the salad okay. and... Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So next speaker, Dr. Tharini Singh. Dr. Tharini is there. Then Dr. Deba Pritam Das. You want to present? Okay. Good morning to one and all present here. Devapratim Das uh, could not come uh, due to some emergency, so I will be presenting. Being co-author, I will be presenting the case. To begin with, cataract surgery in a patient with Down syndrome, a surgical challenge. To begin with, pediatric cataract accounts for 5 to 20 percent of blindness worldwide. Children with Down syndrome have increased risk of being born with cataract or developing cataract later in life. The frequency of early cataract in Down syndrome requiring surgery during childhood is rare, but timely removal and rehabilitation is of utmost importance. So this was a case of an 11-year-old male child presented with diminution of vision of both the eyes, right, more than left, for the last two years, which was gradual in onset and progressive in nature. Patient was mentally retarded, there was developmental delay, and then associated cardiac abnormalities were present. Positive family history was present, and mother was elderly. Antenatal and postnatal history uh, was not uh, significant. Personal history, sleep, snoring was present, daytime sleepiness was there, appetite, bladder, and bowel habits were normal. So on examination, systemic examination, uh, CNS examination of uh, uh, after uh, CNS examination shows low IQ and cognitive impairment, whereas in CVS examination, VSD, AR, atrial enlargement was same. Ocular examination shows visual equity of six by sixty and uh, lamellar cataract. Along with that, uh, the rest rest of the findings were normal. On routine examination, blood investigations were normal, whereas in chest x-ray, right hilar haziness is marked, right descending pulmonary artery is markedly enlarged. ECG was normal, whereas ECO shows VSD, ventricular septal defect, atrial regurgitation, atrial enlargement. USG B scan shows cataractous lens, and the biometry shows plus 21.50 diopter of both the eye. Now, a diagnosis of developmental cataract both eye with Down syndrome with cardiovascular abnormalities was made. Now, initially, we planned for phycoemulsification right eye with foldable eye oil implantation under general anesthesia. But the surgical challenges which comes in Down syndrome patient are, like patient is very much anxious or agitated, there are communication difficulties, hemodynamic instability in cardiac valve problems, atlantoaxial instability or atlanto-occipital instability is present, obstructive sleep apnea might be there, and aspiration during sedation. Uh, might be present. So in my patient, communication difficulties were there because patient was mentally retarded, cardiac wall problems were present and obstructive sleep apnea was also there. So after discussing all the pros and cons and informing patients attendant about the high risk involved in general anesthesia, it was decided to operate the patient under local anesthesia. Proper patients and attendant counseling was done and phaco emulsification right eye with foldable eye oil implantation under local anesthesia was planned followed by visual rehabilitation. Now, this patient, if we operate under local anesthesia also, the risk was patient was, uh, we cannot communicate with patient properly because he was mentally retarded and he was having low IQ level. So, uh, we have to uh, take the mother inside the OT and to counsel the patient and to sit there uh, during the OT. So, post-operative follow-up was done. The patient was doing fine. Wound site was healthy, clear cornea, minimal AC reaction. Lens was in position. 
Best corrected visual equity was 6 by 12. Follow up was done after 15 days and BCVA was found to be 6 by 9 and there was uh, N6 for near correction. So, surgical, medical and developmental outcomes in patients with Down syndrome and cataract who have cataract requiring surgery experience high surgical complication rates. But in our case, there was no surgical complication because after 9 months of follow up also, there was uh, no such complication seen. Down syndrome and early cataract, the frequency of early cataract among children with Down syndrome is estimated to be 1.4% with cataract requiring surgery during childhood being even rarer. So in our case, cataract was there and it needed surgery. Also the outcomes of cataract surgery in children with Down syndrome has been there are other associated uh, complication like strabismus or nystagmus might be there. In this case, there was no such complication. Whereas primary posterior capsular axis with and without anterior vitrectomy in congenital cataract uh, is needed in patient younger than 5 years with congenital cataract. Uh, also in younger patient we uh, uh, do uh, uh, continuous capsular axis and intravitrectomy to prevent posterior capsular opacification. But in this case we did not, de uh, we did not do that but uh, there was no uh, such complication after 9 month of follow up and 2 months back also uh, the patients otherwise was also operated similarly. Acrylic lenses uh, was used which, which according to study also delay the development of PCO. So to conclude with, the early detection and timely surgical intervention gives a good visual recovery. High risk associated with general anesthesia in patients of Down syndrome must be taken into consideration. In our case, high risk was there. Patient uh, could not be taken for uh, general anesthesia. And also with local anesthesia also we have risk because uh, we cannot, if we cannot counsel the patient because patient was mentally retarded, but we have to operate the patient because patient with so much of comorbidities and associated mental retardation if diminution of vision can affect the quality of life. So we have to operate the patient. Proper counseling and a good meticulous surgery in experienced hand prevents post-operative complication. Thank you. So was there any surgical challenge during the surgery? Sir? Was there any surgical challenge as you said? It's a cataract so surgical challenge. challenges uh, like uh, we thought of surgical challenges because patient during the during uh, the surgery patient might get up and <laughs> we cannot do anything. Counter any? Because patient's mother was there inside the OT. She was allowed to sit there and uh, like that we have operated the case. No, no. What I am saying during surgery did you face any difficulties? No. Speaking, you your case went off quite smoothly. So yes, you didn't sir. Didn't face any challenge. <laughs> Initially, uh, anesthesia people were asked, but uh, they uh, sought high risk consent because of so much of comorbidities, and also patient party was not uh, very willing to give the consent. So we thought of operating under local anesthesia, and we have to operate the patient because uh, it was gradually progressive only. And uh, with the quality of life, if patient is uh, seeing less and also the other comorbidities, we have to operate. So in Down syndrome patient, this is a challenge. So patient cooperation is the only thing that you face and the problem. Otherwise, surgery as such is not very difficult. Surgery as okay. such is not. Thank you, sir. Sedation was also not given to the patient. No, sir. No, ma'am. <laughs> very commendable job. Huh? Uh, very commendable job in Thank this you, case to uh, discuss. Uh, that was my first question, whether any sedation was used during the surgery because otherwise the child, it tends to get uncooperative during surgery. So even giving the block, did you all face any uh, difficulties at that time? No, low block we could give. Okay. Block we could give okay. and then sedation was not uh, uh, done. Okay. And the other eye are you planning? Done. Two months back it was done. This was done around nine months back. There was no posterior capsular opacification which we were like uh, uh, thinking that there might be PCO. But uh, it was... I didn't catch which lens you used. Acrylic hydrophobic lens. Acrylic hydrophobic foldable lens. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next speaker, Dr. Dhruvil Nayak. Is it there?
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to do a case report on a case of Bothai congenital ectropion. Uh, this was actually a colloidon baby, which is also known as a lamellar ichthyosis, which is a descriptive term for an infant who is born with an extex tight shiny membrane that resembles a plastic wrap. It is a form of congenital ichthyosis and is an autosomal recessive disorder. The first clinical description of the colloidon membrane was by Press in 1880, which continues to be the valid as the baby skin is replaced by a cornified substance of uniform texture, which gives the body a varnished appearance. The incidence of this is one in three, three lakh live births. There was a con uh, it is also has congenital eversion of the upper eye upper eyelid in colloidon baby was first described by Adams in 1986 and was termed as double congenital ectropion. The condition is usually bilateral but unilateral cases have also been reported. We are hereby reporting a case of bilateral con congenital ectropion in a baby born with lamellar ichthyosis. This is actually the photo showing the child, a baby uh, born at full term by LS. LSCS to a healthy mother aged 23 years of a non consensuous marriage was admitted to NICU at our tertiary care center with signs of dryness of skin, scaling, fissuring at places. The baby was diagnosed to have congenital lamellar ichthyosis. On physical examination, the whole body was found to be covered with a parchment like membrane resembling a colloidon was and was peeling off from the entire body, including the face. There was slight a calbum and the mouth was constantly in an open position like a fish. The patient was managed in the NICU with appropriate fluid and electrolyte along with the prophylactic antibiotics. Emoluents were advised for skin softening and moistening. So not going into the NICU and the skin part. The patient was referring to the ophthalmology department on examination. The patient had bilateral ectropion of both upper and lower eyelids. The eyelashes were missing. There was no evidence of discharge, corneal opacities or keratitis. The rest of the anterior segment was normal. We managed the patient conservatively by use of hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose 2%, eye ointment and lubricants, eye drops. Thus the case was managed successfully with requirement of no surgical intervention. This uh, The baby was then discharged and the 15 day follow up picture of the baby was uh, is here. Now discussing more on that, uh, the ocular manifestation can be in the form of exposure keratitis which is secondary to the ectropion, unilateral megalocornea, enlarged corneal nerve, blepharitis, absence of mebo mebomian gland, trichiasis, medarosis, absence of lacrimal gland, ectropion of both upper and lower lids. According to Punctal Maheshwari at all, the underlying cases of eversion remains obscure and several possible mechanisms have also been proposed and associations have been recognized. Abnormalities, the associations are abnormalities such as orbicularis, hypotonia, birth trauma, vertical shortening of the anterior lamella or vertical elongation of the posterior lamella of the eyelid, failure of the orbital septum to fuse with levator aponeurosis, absence of effective lateral canthal ligament, lateral elongation of the eyelid, have all been implicated as possible pathophysiological factors. Venous stasis during surgery may also cause marked chemosis and the prolapse of the conjunctiva causing eversion of the eyelids. There is evidence which suggests that ectropion in colloidon babies can be managed conservatively by local application of clobestol. Ectropion is in lamellar ichthyosis may respond to conservative management in early period of life in about half of the cases. The goal of management is to prevent the decussation of, uh, of the exposed conjunctiva and allow spontaneous inversion of the lid. Surgical treatment options include temporary tarsorafi subconjunctival injection of hyaluronic acid, fornic sutures and full thickness skin graft to the upper lid. The full prognosis of the child is very good if proper care from dermatology, ophthalmology and pediatric department is taken. A comprehensive early management in such cases has shown extremely good result and we are able to avoid surgical intervention. Uh, in last I would conclude with bilateral ectropion is most common ocular finding in cases of lamellar ichthyosis which is initially best managed conservatively. Topical lubricants and proper patching with regular follow up is the initial line of management. Surgical intervention is planned only if the conservative management does not give desired results. These are my references. Thank you. Doctor first thing I'd like to highlight that your slides. Usually, this should not be like as you see in textbooks. It should be point wise and not more than four, five, six lines per slide. It is almost as if you have copied.
paragraphs from text in the few okay. initial few slides if you note it okay. and secondly the references has to be put as as we see in index journals it okay. is not like that okay. i'll take Just hold on, hold on for me. How much follow-up have you achieved in this child? Sir, uh, the patient uh, belonged to a rural area, so we could attend two follow-ups, uh, in which we did not find any complication following the ectropy on any corneal opacities or anything. Okay, so up to how many days follow-up? Sir, the first follow-up was 15 days. We were able to, uh, actually, I was able to see that child. The next follow-up, I was uh, unavailable due to certain, but the, uh, which I was after a month, and uh, it was... Uh, Good means there was no any complications. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So next speaker is uh, Dr. Yes. Jyoti. Okay. Uh, so we don't have her. Then uh, is Dr. Shubhesh Cha Parab is there? A uh, very good morning to everyone, judges and the audience sitting here. Uh, I'm Dr. Shubhicha Parab. I'm from Goa Medical College. And uh, being coming from Goa, we love fishing and we love to eat fish both. So I'm here to present a rare case of corneal perforation with a glass perchlet fish. Ocular trauma is a leading cause of blindness and visual morbidity. Sports and recreational activities related eye injuries accounts for around 6 lakhs cases per year. Corneal perforation is an ophthalmic emergency requiring an immediate intervention. Coming to the case report, a 26-year-old male presented to our emergency department with the history of trauma to left eye due to the impact of the glass perchlet fish jumping out of the water while he was fishing. The associated symptoms were ocular pain and blurring of vision in that eye. You can see the uh, glass perchlet fish picture being displayed. Coming to the ocular examination, the best corrected visual acuity in the left eye was 6 by 9 and that in the right eye was 6 by 6. On slit lamp examination, the conjunctiva showed circumcorneal congestion. On corneal examination, there, was, there were noted two tears. The first one is the 3 millimeters full thickness laceration as depicted by the black arrow in the picture and below that was a 1.5 millimeters partial thickness laceration depicted by the red arrow. The anterior chamber was minimally shallow and there was no associated reaction. The right eye examination was normal. As you can see in the picture, the Seidel's test was positive as the fluorescein dye gets diluted by the leaking aqueous and the rest of the ocular examination in the left eye was within normal limits. Coming to management, the patient was hospitalized, started on systemic antibiotics and the tear was sealed by cyanoacrylate glue and bandage contact lens was applied under topical anesthesia. Coming to discussion. Direct injury with fish accounts for blunt ocular trauma, which is seen most commonly. Penetrating ocular injury because of the impact of fish is rare, as in our case. So, the possible mechanism which we are thinking for a penetrating injury in our case could be because of the impact of fish fin or because of the fish teeth. So I would like to conclude from my case report that a uh, protective eyewear is must while fishing or any other uh, recreational activities which reduces the risk of eye injury by 90% and it should be worn by both. It should be worn by the active participants as well as the bystanders. Small tests can be managed by sutureless methods like cyanoacrylate glue and even minor ocular injuries require immediate medical attention. Thank you. Oh, how many such cases have been reported in literature? Did you do a literature search? So very less cases are reported. There was one case uh, reported with a fish which has a long uh, 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 
uh, nose kind of thing and that patient presented with direct impact of that uh, this thing uh, in the cornea and they had to actually cut the fish and the piece was impacted in the cornea and then they had to remove it but that was because of the uh, half of the fish had almost gone in the patient's cornea sir so that is one case which was reported so it's a very rare yes sir. nice presentation thank you uh, i just wanted to ask you a very basic question how did you perform that serials test if you can run us through that okay uh, first we explained to the uh, patient the procedure what will be doing then we took uh, we put a a pair again uh, eye drop that's the uh, anesthetic eye drop uh, then we took the fluorescein strip wetted with the uh, normal saline drop then we uh, retract the lower eyelid just swipe just swipe the uh, uh, lower phonics and ask the patient to blink then under cobalt blue filter we observe the uh, we ask the patient to constantly blink and open 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 and close the eye so that when the aqueous gets leaked out the fluorescein dye gets diluted so you can see the uh, uh, it's uh, the dye getting diluted can be seen okay so tell me did your patient manage to catch that fish which you showed is yes sir this this picture this picture was brought by him only to show us so actually this picture is from the patient only <laughs> Okay thank you good So next uh, Dr Soumya uh, sorry Dr Shilpa Somanlal Somanlal So Dr Rajneel Bhattacharya Good morning respected panelist and everyone present uh, my study is uh, different eye injuries in children a hospital based study i am dr rajneel bhattacharji of shilcha medical college in hospital assam there is no financial disclosure or conflict of interest eye injuries are a cause of major under recognized disability and ocular morbidity that affects the young to a great extent it is a leading cause of non congenital unilateral blindness in children and thus ocular trauma is the most common avoidable cause of childhood blindness children are more prone to ocular trauma because of their predilection towards hazardous play outdoor activities and relative lack of judgment as such all ocular injuries cannot always be prevented but by identifying underlying factors in the etiology of serious injuries it may be possible to reduce Uh, it may be possible to find out the most effective method of reducing the incidence of visually damaging trauma the aim of the study was to investigate the causes and outcomes of different ocular traumas in children it was a prospective observational study 100 children up to 15 years of age presenting to ophthalmology opd or emergency department with eye injuries over a duration of 1 year when included the inclusion criteria were children up to 15 years of age with ocular injuries and exclusion criteria was children with any pre existing ocular diseases various information was collected on the demographic details of the child the cause mechanism site and place of injury thorough ocular examination and necessary investigations were done and appropriate treatment was given final visual acuity was recorded in the injured eye after treatment and after follow ups informed consent from patients parents or guardians and necessary ethical clearance was obtained in results uh, in sex wise distribution of the patient around 61% of the patients were male and 39% were female the most common mechanism of injury was blunt trauma in around 67% and followed by penetrating injuries in 23% the most common place of injury was found to be home in around 62% followed by school and playground the most common cause of injury were varied with similar uh, 
uh, percentage in around sport, assault, or fireworks related, and toy gun or pen pencil related injuries. The most of the patients could be managed medically in around 66% and 26% required surgical intervention. The final visual acuity was more than 6 by 12 in most of the patient in around 68%. Now, uh, around 67% ocular injuries were due to blunt trauma and 23% due to penetrating injuries and 62% ocular injuries occurred at home. Now, these similar findings were observed in studies done by McEwen, CJ et al. 1999, Rappaport I et al., Ashae Eo and Saxena R et al. and various other studies. From this study, we can infer that in children, blunt and penetrating trauma are fairly common. This study has shown that the most common place for eye injuries is home. However, it may be difficult to influence its incidence as lots of causes are responsible for the injury. Most of the injuries can be managed medically with good outcome. Thank you. Have you compared with any other studies? Yes, ma'am. Almost similar findings where there, those studies also show that uh, there are, like in home is the uh, most common cause or while playing. F similar findings were there, ma'am. Lots of studies. Few anything studies. Anything new, no. anything different from the other studies, what you got uh, here? My findings were similar to other studies which I found. But the what thing I was like uh, surprised in myself also in some other studies by uh, study was that the home seems to be the very fair common place for injuries. We have found lots of patients uh, getting uh, uh, this uh, per corneal perforation or this due to in home while playing with their siblings or from due to other children. Very fairly common. Or the house home related injuries were very common in this periphery and some those cases. Uh, I missed the year in which the study was done, but just a point, did you notice that it increased in the last two years when most children were at home during COVID? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we found there was more cases. We're coming into our OPDs and emergency department. Okay, and one more question. You said 66, or maybe I don't know, yeah, okay, 66, 26 medical surgical. Uh, any idea what that breakup was like and what the visual outcomes were in between those? Uh, Ma'am, uh, this uh, most cases medically managed were the like mild ecchymosis or this, uh, just uh, some hyphema maybe, but uh, those uh, perforating injuries had poor visual outcome. However, their time of presentation drastically improved their uh, follow-up this vision because if they presented very late, then we could not uh, recover their vision very properly. I'm just asking because it might be interesting to analyze that to make the yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I need to do this study further, like in child proofing in the homes. This is a very important thing, ma'am. Especially in periphery, even in fairly uh, good homes, the uh, parents are a bit uh, conscious and the, the injuries are little less. But those who are coming with from peripheries and those they're very common. And I think, ma'am, uh, education about the cause and maybe, you know, this may help actually to reduce the incidence that is required. So maybe a sub-analysis of their uh, parents' education level. Yes, ma'am. Parents' education, I have... Uh, yes, ma'am. It needs to be done, ma'am. Parents' education might help to reduce the incidence in lots of cases. You said this was a prospective study. Yes, sir. So was it, is it a longitudinal, ongoing study? Or? No, uh, almost all the cases came, sir, because I started in uh, long, uh, one, two, three back, sir, and most of the cases were followed up within two years. So. Okay, so what was your point of start? Was it you started with the injury or you started with normal children? And no, sir, uh, point of injury. After the point of injury, when they came, I kept their phone numbers and all. I, those who were followed up uh, by themselves, okay. And if they did not follow up, I called them and make them come or I contacted them. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You, sir. Thank you, sir. So, next uh, presenter is Dr. Sham Sundar Das Mahapatra.
So good morning all. So my presentation is alteration of phobial structure. Alteration of phobial structure and thickness following blunt ocular trauma, a case series. So I have no conflict of interest to declare or no financial interest. So coming to the introduction part, ocular trauma is a preventable public health problem and it is one of the commonest cause of ophthalmic morbidity and monocular blindness. This is changing automatically. This is changing automatically. Please stop it. It's changing automatically. Yeah, next, yeah, this is. So, sorry for the interruption. So blunt ocular trauma forms the major part of the ocular trauma. It causes ocular damage by the cope and contract cope and contract cope mechanism or by the ocular compression. Corvilli was first to introduce the concept of cope and contract cope injury by explaining the brain damage <coughs> caused by the blunt trauma to the head. Later, Walter explained the injuries by blunt trauma using the same concept. Commercial retin is a transient Transient retinal opacification due to the... You can exit slide show and just present it as... Uh, exit slide show and just present it. So, commercial retin is a transient retinal opacification due to the outer retinal disruption occurring in a contracup injury followed by blunt trauma. Histological studies. Can I present uh, in this mode? Yeah, sure. You don't have to present it in the slideshow mode. Don't worry. It's fine. You uncheck this one, if you can. Okay, please keep it like this. Thank you. Histo histological studies have revealed that disruption occurs at the level of photoreceptor outer segments and retinal pigment epithelium. In commercial retina, optical coherence tomography examination reveals typical outer retinal changes corresponding to the photoreceptor damage. We know it is usually self-limiting and results within three to four weeks without any specific treatment. However, the photoreceptor damage may or may not be reversible depending upon the extent of the initial trauma Thus, the visual loss may be transient or permanent. So the purpose of this uh, presentation is to describe the alteration of phobial structure and thickness following blunt trauma in three cases. Coming to the case one, this is a 35 years old male was referred to our hospital three days after sustaining injury with a cricket ball to his left eye. On presentation, he had a visual acuity of 6x6 6 6 and N6 in OD and 6x18 N10 in left eye. The anterior and posterior segment examinations revealed post-traumatic iditis, angle recession and commosio retini in left eye with normal intraocular pressure in left eye and the right eye findings were within normal limits. 
So this is the fundus photograph which was done at one day post-operative period, a one day post-trauma period which is showing the commercial retini. So the patient had already performed fundus photograph and OCT elsewhere before coming to our hospital. The OCT was performed at one day post-trauma which has revealed increased refractivity in the area of the photoreceptor outer segment which we can see in figure. Now the visual acuity was uh, uh, maintained at 6 by 18 N 10 and the repeat OCT revealed that complete loss of photoreceptor uh, with the foveal thinning after two weeks which we can see in the second OCT photograph. Coming to the case two, a 19 year old male was referred to our hospital two days after sustaining injury with a bamboo stick to his right eye. On presentation, he had a visual acuity of 6 by 18 pars and N12 in right eye and 6 by 6 N6 in left eye. The anterior and posterior segment examinations revealed traumatic mydriasis, post-traumatic iditis and commotion retini in right eye with normal intraocular pressure. Left eye findings were within normal limits. So, the patient had already performed OCT elsewhere before coming to our hospital. So the first OCT which is uh, taken at two days post trauma which is revealed increased reflectivity in the area of photoreceptive outer segments which is shown in the figure, first figure. Now the patient had uh, undergone a second OCT after four weeks which was done in our hospital which had shown a complete loss of photoreceptor with foveal thinning after four weeks. And the patient had maintained a visual acuity of 6 by 18 and N12 after four weeks of follow up. Coming to the third case, a 28 years old male was reported four weeks after sustaining punch injury with a closed fist to his right eye. So when he had present to our hospital, his visual acuity was 6 by 60 and less than N36 in right eye and 6 by 6 N6 in left eye. The anterior and posterior segment examination revealed iridodialysis, angle recession and foveal atrophy in right eye with normal intraocular pressure. Left eye findings were within normal limits. So, both these OCTs which are shown in this figure were done at the outside. First OCT was performed five days post trauma which had revealed a disruption of the photoreceptor outer and inner segment at the phobia which is shown in the first picture. And subsequent OCT was performed four weeks post trauma revealed a complete loss of photoreceptor with foveal thinning which is the second photograph. So all these three patients maintained a visual acuity of 6 by 18 N10, 6 by 18 pars N12 and 6 by 60 less than N36 in first, second and third cases respectively. Coming to the discussion part, commercial retini due to blunt ocular trauma necessitates a thorough ophthalmic examination to detect other serious accompanying injuries like globe rupture, iridodialysis, post-traumatic iditis, angle recession, traumatic optic neuropathy and retinal tears etc. We know that no specific treatment is generally required for commercial retini, which may resolve spontaneously within three to four weeks with recovery of vision. The treatment is essentially supportive and directed to the associated ocular injuries following blunt trauma. The visual acuity in commercial retini varies from 6 by 6 to 6 by 120 and may not always correlate with the degree of retinal opacification. The vision loss may be transient or permanent. The major site of retinal damage appears to be at the level of photoreceptor outer segments. OCT shows involvement of the photoreceptor outer segment with preservation of the inner retinal architectures, which also correlate with the histopathological study by Sipperle et al. So in conclusion, vision loss following blunt ocular trauma can occur due to various reasons which are yet to be elucidated completely. Alteration of foveal structure and thickness is associated with permanent vision loss following blunt ocular trauma. Clinical examination and evaluation using OCT may help in detecting the foveal sequelae and visual outcome in eyes with blunt trauma. These are my references. Thank you. So could you tell me the findings of your second case again? The anterior segment and posterior segment findings of your second case of the case series. Yeah, yes sir. The second case, sir, anterior segment findings was traumatic iditis and there was post tra uh, traumatic mydriasis. And posterior segment was only commercial retini. There was no other complications. Okay, so in all your cases, there was a severe trauma which involved the iditis. Yeah, third case had the most severe trauma, but the third case came after four weeks. They had done all follow-ups in outside hospital and after that, they came to us. And here, like first examination, they had done in other hospital and after that, they came to us. So what is the aim of your this thing? What do you want to project out of your case series? Because sir, most of the times we uh, face many of the cases with commercial retinae in trauma cases. 
but most of the times we see that visual recovery is excellent all the cases most of the times they recover completely but these are three cases which we found that there is no visual recovery at all because there is a loss of photoreceptors within two to four weeks of the trauma so it may not be predictable always that how the patient will uh, so could you correlate continue. with any other uh, cases which recovered. So what is the difference between those which have recovered and those which have not recovered? Uh, yes, sir. I had not compared in this study, but yes, we had seen many cases like there was a, uh, clinically there was commercial retini or there may not be in commercial retini, but in OCT we had seen that photoreceptor segments, there is some disruptions, but later on the patient may regain vision up to 6 by 6 or 6 by 9. We might uh, take a study in later on to compare this effects. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. So, the last speaker now is uh, Dr. Sukriti Gupta. Is she there? So, any other speaker who was absent earlier has come later. So, I think uh, we come to the end of this session. Any, anything else from Okay, thank you all for patient listening. All excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much.